It's Survivor's Friendly Fire Show, episode 236 for April 2023. I am, well, I'm live at my home if you happen to be there, but not live. It's a recording. I'm Steve Wright, and Ben is Ben Salter, and he is in Tokyo, but not because this week he is again in your ear holes. Um, I'm back, Steve. Yes. I hope you're having a good trip. I'm sure I'm talking to you in, in, like, actual time in a couple weeks' time from now, like, just, you know, checking in, making sure you're having good ramen or whatever is going on, but... Let me just reiterate, okay. I hope you're having a good time. I hope I'm having a good time now. So, uh, But now in the actual now, not when you're listening to this now, the real now, which I suppose is the fake now. Anyway, it doesn't God. matter. It's where, We're here to chat about E3. Part two of our E3 was super important, but it's no longer with us, at least not for this year. Uh, we'll get to it if we think it might come back at some point shortly. Last week, we largely spoke around... The early days of E3, as in when the conference itself started from 95 onwards, and then our kind of first few years going there and our experiences and what we thought. And I think we didn't really know what to expect the first few years. So maybe we'll actually start there. What was it like maybe? So we both went in 2012 Mm -hmm. for the first time. What were you thinking by like, say, maybe 2014, 15? You'd been to a few. So we'd... We both went to actually quite a few consecutively, so I think we were there maybe four or five years in a row, which gives you that that prior knowledge and what to do and yeah. what to change and what to look out for and how to structure your days and definitely get a little jaded in in all the good ways. Like, yeah. it was super fun, always liked it, but you definitely kind of know that it's going to be a long day or a long three days. Uh, and yeah, what were you starting to look out for by like year three, four? Well, 2015 is the year that like literally all of us went because um, mm. then we went to Las Vegas and had like a bachelor party and then I got married like I just tacked on my, my wedding at, to the end of E3 really because it was a good time to be in North America um, yeah. and I think by then like all the things that I was talking about last week I'd, I'd, I'd sorted out I'd, I'd probably, I probably maxed out my schedules those years and maxed out the schedules of those people who were writing for Survivor you weren't at the time um, that's how long ago this was Ben and yeah still was smart enough to leave gaps i think so i would max things out but then like you know maybe go back in and like remove a couple of appointments once i'd like locked all the things that i really wanted to win in case i wanted to make time to see a surprise announcement or something like i remember the year that resident evil 2 remake was on the show floor i don't think this was 2015 i like moved heaven and earth to be able to see it the same thing for control like i managed to like worm my way into like a, a remedy meeting which wasn't on the show floor it was kind of like up but not in the normal meeting rooms to be able to see that and like i saw sam lake and lost my mind it was the best um so kind of strategically working along those lines in terms of what i was trying to see and what i was trying to do still left the insert out of my my badge of course because uh, i was a cool kid by that point and and even though we were working really hard i think i just kind of knew that it was going to be the worst week ever so even though i'd you know put in 12 hours of working or something like i would make time to go and hit up a bar with you and like go and do this and just have like two hours sleep and run on fumes the whole time because it is it's something that you'll never get to not ne- get to do again but it was kind of like this is the only time it's going to happen this year like this is this is this is it so i might as well just be in all in and then die the happen. next week yeah what about you <laughs> uh well so the second year i went was definitely different because we had two people for mmgn that was the first year tano and i both went he must have gone in 2011 and i went 12 and then we decided let's both go for the next like three years and so that definitely helped having two i think you need to to kind of see at least all the big things in those years when it was busy you needed at least two people like it was just impossible otherwise so no, that helped and kind of splitting stuff up, trying to get stuff closer together. Uh, having worked in that industry for a little bit longer by then, I knew more people. I was, I kind of knew how it worked and I pushed more to get to see stuff in those fancy upstairs hidden rooms, not actually on the show floor. Yep. Way easier. If you had to do an interview, you can actually hear it when you played it back as opposed to just like booming bass over the top of everything. And that got worse as it got, as it got further along and it was open to the public. So that was later. So... I would actually say we we're talking about the peak being earlier for its importance, but I would say it was still super, like hitting pretty well and doing what it needed to do. And you got great content up until 2015. I would say that was still a really strong year. It was still closed to the public then, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, still a great year. Maybe it was starting to slide at that point. It was the, the new consoles were out. Like the, the years the consoles were announced were pretty big. And I feel like E3 was still needed for the, and we're talking last gen. So the, the Xbox One and the PS4, 
uh, that was that was a pretty big deal. And there was that weird moment where there were still some games there from the the gen before that, the PS3 and the 360, and it was kind of like eh, I don't want to fly all, all the way to LA to see a 360 game. Uh, it's not worth it. <laughs> Publishers still pushing that on you because they still wanted to sell it and they still wanted promotion for it. But we was like, that's not exciting. Like seeing the consoles, way more exciting. Uh, and yeah, certainly, I think the and all the people kind of sharing their now E3s over my favorite memory photos. If you see people's first few years, there's a lot of like taking photos with the merch and like being with the Mario War Pipe and like that level of stuff, or like actually sitting in the world of Tank's Tank that was otherwise just in the way. And then after you'd been a couple of years, it was just like, nah, forget all that. I have no photos of that stuff from probably beyond the first year. The only one, oh, that was probably, because that was a 360 game. Like, I remember having, there's a photo of me with, like, a stupid, like, you're a criminal, hold up the little, like, you're a criminal sign. Mm. Was, you're getting your mugshot for Battlefield Hardline. And I'm just like, I'm like, I'm, oh, yeah. they're making that. me do this. So, okay, I'll just hold this up. And I just look, it was my first appointment of the morning. I look like death for all the reasons that I was talking about before. Um, but they're like they they for the Bandai Namco Star Trek tie-in, like the Chris Pine movie game. They had like they kind of recreated a little portion of the bridge of the Enterprise. So I was I was all for that. Like that had a giant grin on my face. Like that was probably the only like publicity not publicity photo, but like whatever media activation photo that I actually wanted to get, which was neat. Um, I think 2015 was kind of this. It's you, you kind of start saying seeing it slide a little bit mm. and that's when the, you know like maybe esa was thinking about letting in the public i, th I thought it was 2015 so maybe they were doing it in so or maybe it wasn't the esa I but i know it was 16 was that the first year that it went public not a fact based show but i think the 2015 press conference is when we kind of somehow at, at microsoft got shuffled to the front and we were in one of the oh, front yeah. rows but it wasn't and, I, and this is going off what we were saying last week like you know like the the media executives are going to all these journalists who take out the cardboard inserts of their their name badges are you hyped and we're like yeah but like just get to the point i'm taking notes here let's go that year yeah. 2015 is when microsoft was bringing in i think they oh, called wait. them like the fan fest people yeah like influencers like just fans and it's absolutely fine to be a fan but those people were so excited to be there like phil spencer coughed and they were like up on their feet cheering and clapping and like there was like the five or six of us that somehow got into the front with these people kind of like sitting on our chairs yeah. timidly looking around being like we are not supposed to be here yeah and that was like the sort of the evolution of e3 yeah then i think it was uh so 2017 was actually the first year open to the public so you couldn't buy a ticket until then but yeah def people definitely got in i think it was some level of just knowing people and you're not meant to share passes and things but of course people do. well and the press conferences um, you can invite whoever the heck you want like that's, yeah. yeah and so this was press conference not e3 go back to last week's episode for an explanation of that uh i think those fan fest people were i think the early years they weren't really fans as such they were what would now be a, called an influencer they were people who had a following who were youtubers or whatever uh but the first few years were at e3 still felt very like executive retailer media centric there wasn't a lot of people just like filming and streaming or whatever that was still pretty early days the yeah it would ultimately basically kill off games journalism at least to the degree that it was back then uh yeah 2015 was probably when it started to turn there was like you'd walk down a hallway and there's like 10 people trying to film and the first couple of minutes you're like oh i don't want to walk through the shot and then you just you give up on that and you just like forget it too many people in the way this is like there's things to do here like don't take up the yeah. whole hall oh. trying to film your dodgy vlog or whatever people were doing that not even in the hallways but like on the show floor like they they were standing mm. like against a booth but they had someone on the other side of the like alley like filming them and people were like stopping to let them in i'm like nah beeline through sorry you can't no you, you can't like block this thoroughfare good luck yeah. i sort of delighted in doing it if i'm being perfectly honest but yeah like that that was all sort of all happening at the same time um and I don't, I don't, not a fact-based show, but you started to, to kind of see changes all across the board in terms of like, you know, the likes of of Nintendo going, ah, like we'll we'll be on the show floor, but we we don't need to do a a live press conference. We can record it, we can, and, yeah, and put it out on on YouTube just like we would for the live stream. But you know, we don't have to have this huge a AV technical circus making sure this live event is broadcast to the internet. We'll just do it on the internet. Um, EA yeah, deciding. Was, Go ahead. That was that was probably the the very first thing that like Nintendo pulling out of a live conference, doing a direct. So you're watching at home, no change really. 
Uh, and they, they still probably set the tone of how to do that now, but it was very polished. It lost that kind of, as we were talking about last week, the like Reggie pulling something out of his pocket element because it was pretty, like you lose that even if you're trying to fake it. Uh, and they had some cool moments with kind of Iwata and Reggie still doing stuff together, which they don't do anymore. They've gone even more serious in their early days of direct. Uh, but that was probably the first step of things changing and realizing we don't actually need to do it like this. We can do it way more controlled. Nothing can go wrong this way. Um, it was kind of good the first, I'm thinking it might have been, was 2012 even their last live conference or did they do one in 13 as well? Can't remember, not a fact-based joke. Um, yeah, I can't remember either. I, I know I went, went to, to at least two, one. I thought, but I okay. could be lying. I could be so lying. Let's, let's say it was maybe 2014, they just went direct. And it was because that was always the Tuesday. So the morning of the first day of E3, it was like Nintendo in the morning and then the show opens at like 11 or 12 or something. Uh, so to not have to physically go somewhere and then get like a rush back to the convention center and try to ride it up in between somehow was kind of good initially. Um, and yet probably didn't realize at the time that was maybe the first step towards do we need E3? Uh, because then I would say two years later, EA dropped out. And that was probably the big moment, as you were just about to say. Uh, I think they were gone in maybe 2015 was their last year. And then 2016, they weren't there anymore. It became EA Play. Yeah. So they did something next door. Uh, now, I was there that year. I think that was the first year I covered it for Survivor. So you wouldn't have been there. Right. Um, and definitely felt different. It was like it was there was a big because EA used to have a massive booth. You'd walk in and you'd be hit in the face with, you know, Star Wars, FIFA, uh, The Sims. Like it was pretty overwhelming, the EA booth. And so I think they moved 2K or something into that slot, like something still kind of big, but not as big. And it just felt like something was missing. And it was EA still wanted you to do stuff as being there as media. They were kind of like, come across the street to our thing. Yeah. Uh, so it was still like, oh, we're still getting EA content, but it, it was definitely definitely a hole and i would say that was those two things nintendo losing the live press conference and a few years later ea dropping out entirely was probably the beginning of e3 kind of winding up yeah and it's it's kind of a little bit about you know like let's do our messaging our way and completely control it without any of the extra technical stuff that we need to worry about and you know ea going prompted sony to eventually decide it didn't need to be there uh, you know, in the, in the same way that it was, you know, even to Microsoft deciding it was going to do it from E3 adjacent Next locations, door. but not E3 proper, because it's the Microsoft theater and they, you know, they're not going to charge themselves the rent to be there and they have a bigger area and they can do whatever they want. And yeah, it, it, yeah it's, yeah. it's the, the writing started to become on, you know, to be putting up, be put up on the wall. Sure, that'll work. Um, then the introduction of, of general public days, people like Devolver coming, but not wanting to, I, like, I'm assuming, pay the yeah, exorbitant costs and go and, you know, do it in an adjacent car park. So it's the, you're, it's all people wanting to have a, a bit more control of what they're doing. And I think the ESA not wanting that to happen. They wanted that kind of firm control. and, and they, Yeah, they fought to keep it and probably somewhat ironically opening the doors to the public in 2017 was that was probably one of the final nails in the coffin in that it totally changed the vibe and it it kind of left questioning what's the point of this now if it's just going to be another like a, a game convention for fans like PAX already goes all around the US and we have one in Australia and there's a bunch of similar things all over the world why do we need like if E3 is going to become that it, it's kind of lost its purpose like it not being that is why it was still relevant. Yeah. Well, so I don't know if we need to beat a dead horse. And I, I think it's a dead horse at this stage. I don't think E3 2024 is, is going to be a thing. But what do, what do you make of it? I think... Well, so I went to the last E3 in person in 2019. And I we were going to go in 2020... And I kind of thought that might be the like the it's a make or break year. Like it's they either figure it out and it, they revitalize it and it comes back. And I thought it had a chance because it was going to be the new console year and it was going to be you get to announce two new consoles. Um, I think Sony did pull out of 2019, but they and that certainly I think that was the final. That was the actual final nail. It was one of the platform holders, the biggest platform holder not being there kind of signaled where are we going from and that was again xbox were next door and they were still part of e3 but they weren't in the convention center so it felt empty like this there was one hall was basically always just xbox nintendo sony next to each other there was no xbox in there because they were next door there was no sony in there there was like the u.s army had basically taken most of that hall was like a come and join the army because there's now public in there so like they can promote other stuff 
Yep. It just didn't feel like E3 anymore. Um, so I kind of, yeah, there was, I think Activision weren't there that year either. Like there were, there were actually a lot of gaps already. And it kind of felt like they had one more chance with the new consoles if they all reliant on getting Sony to come back and announce it there. And I don't know if Sony ever announced if they were going to go back to E3 or not. Um, but certainly, so Xbox would have been there. And I think they would have gone all in on announcing the Series X there because it still would have had massive eyeballs on it and yep. would have made sense for them. But yeah, losing it then, I think having a few years where they tried to pretend it was still a thing digitally, but it was definitely not. And then trying to bring it back now, but there's no publisher interest, which also to me says whatever the pitch was to publishers, like there must have been some case to kind of say, this is why we think it should come back and this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to update it. And we would love you all to be back for these reasons. Mustn't have been compelling at all. Like no. they probably were the same ESA that they were five, six years ago being like, we really want to cling to how things were when we were super relevant and not really change much. I kind of feel like they were just like, so you, you guys are all going to come back, right? Pandemic's over. We're just going to do the same old thing. And it was dying before then. So yeah. I well, can't see a way that it would come back. And something that's also kind of keeping this down is Summer Game Fest or the yeah. the mid-year Game Awards, whatever you want to kind of call it. It's that Jeff Keighley... Um, curated experience that you know you could argue the Oscars are sort of trying to pivot towards it's not just like the in the game awards especially in that case like it's not just the winner is this it's like world premiere here's 17 trailers and here's the rock talking about whatever energy drink he's deciding to put on the market like it's it's a weird spectacle that doesn't need to have Microsoft's full buy-in because Microsoft can still do its own live stream whenever it wants, but in that week, ideally, and, you know, you can, like, tack a Game Fest logo on it and be like, yeah, we, we're partners in this, but, like, it's really just Microsoft doing whatever Microsoft wants and maybe throwing Jeff a bone and saying, okay, well, you can have the avowed yeah. trailer in your thing, but we're gonna, we're gonna show the perfect Dark gameplay or whatever they're planning to do this year, so... I think the the ESA isn't going to change, and I think Jeff's kind of dropped into that space and is doing a more modern take on what it should be. And I don't, I don't feel like there's room for both of these things to be up no. and competing. That's to the point where, like, I think E3 knew it lost, and that's why it's not here this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we will lose with Summer Game Fest as a replacement is all that stuff that came out of the showroom floor, all those little kind of, the little snippets that would come out of interviews or people kind of spotting something in a gameplay demo that they played, which wasn't actually announced or wasn't given the the, uh, the spotlight. That will all be lost because it's all going to be super curated yep. world premiere trailers of this is exactly what we want you to see. Way more um, controlled marketing. And this is just, mostly what people seem to want right like there was a real push towards we we want the truth we want influencers who are going to tell us the truth but they all got paid to go to e3 well the biggest ones did like they got an appearance fee and they would just say exactly what the publishers want now, yeah surprise that hasn't been blown more wide open but they all definitely were um and so yeah like they would very rarely point out something that wasn't meant to be seen or wasn't really promoting the positives of things yeah so i think we're going to lose that what we will probably get instead is people watching something uh, like in the last state of play, you'd have like, here's our 10 minute deep dive into Suicide Squad or whatever the game was. And people being like, well, that was bad. Yeah. And like, I think publishers not real like they're maybe getting a little too comfortable thinking they've got such control over it that they, they can't even necessarily see when they've disappointed people because it's too similar. Even the, the most recent Zelda um, Nintendo Direct was just playing and showing very little. Yeah. And a lot of fans loved it because it was deep dive into a specific mechanic but a lot of people were kind of like well when are you going to show us the interesting stuff and it was because it's so controlled that's all we will see yeah. if it had been at E3 there would have been people trying to break stuff and can I try something else and you'd get you know an interview that kind of revealed something so we're going to lose that it's going to be a bit different Yeah. or or it goes the other way and you get these 10 minute gameplay trailers that they think are amazing and they're so controlled it's yeah. like not indicative of the game at all and then the finished product comes out and people feel like they've been manipulated and lied to like and there's no room for anyone like us to kind of go in and try to scrutinize or attack or ask to play not attack but you know what i mean like try to get yeah, to the the meat and potatoes yeah yeah anyhow things eh. have changed yeah well like one of my favorite things about about 
E3. It's like it's just the random stuff that happens that you were talking about. Like I, I got hands on with De- uh, Destiny. It must have been Destiny Two. I can't remember. But it's when they changed, they swapped out um, Nathan Fillion for Nolan North, and I'm like, that's not his voice. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna keep picking at you in this. And like, I think I got the exclusive on that. That yeah, okay, fine. It's we're not using his voice. We're switching the voice actor. Like you won't, you don't kind of get stuff like that. Or like you can pick up on it, but then you send an email to Activision. And they're like, oh no, comment. We're not, we're not prepared to talk about that just yet. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you lose opportunities for those neat little things. But I guess that's a good segue into like favorite moments. That was one of mine. Do you wanna? We'll keep bouncing back and forth until we run out of cool things to talk about. What's one of your favorite things? Oh, well, I'm trying to look through. I've got my impressions from E3 2012, like when I actually re- like recapped everything I did. And it's interesting to go back to bouncing between boots. Like I clearly went on my first day EA and then Capcom because like that's there's heaps on all those. At the time, seems like I was uh, excited for Resident Evil 6. <laughs> Although it was kind of like, I actually know I questioned like is this actually going to be good like it seems like it might be but like what's all this about so I have no memory of any of this uh, and then playing Halo 4 so I think we got to play multiplayer uh, it's vaguely coming back to me now that I see this and it's like yeah just that that level of going hands on with a game that you've played the series through so far uh, in the first few years definitely super exciting and Something that they could redo, like if they wanted to release stuff wider, not just media, but to everyone, more demos that are time specific around E3, like the tech exists for that now. But it wouldn't be as cool. Like getting to play, apparently I played one chapter of the campaign and a few rounds of multiplayer. That must have been awesome. A few years later, then I did Halo again in 2019 on uh, xCloud, and that, that was pretty cool as well. So like that's my bookend of, of Halo at E3. Uh, and not that I use xCloud at all, but like the first time actually playing it was like, actually, this works. This could actually be a thing. Then I never did. Oh, there you go. I, 2012 was the year that they announced Watch Dogs, and that's like almost mm. <laughs> that's Ubisoft kind of doing it backwards. They were they were giving the wrong idea of a game way before it was popular. Now, um, but like, it, and that was that's all these kind of E3 things falling into place. Like we had there's for the Yonks, there was like an Australian games scene. It was developers, it was publishers, it was writers, kind of drinks. Um, I met tons of people like i met um god richard from naughty dog who is an art director he's he's no longer there he's started his own studio mountaintop like met him he's australian but he, he works over there randomly when i got a job at um uh, an agency like two or three years ago when i was swapping around like one of my colleagues um, husband's best friend is Richard. Like, this weird how the world is small. Anyway, that has nothing to do with E3. Um, at the work drinks, someone maybe let slip a little drunkenly that Watch Dogs was... Oh, they didn't say it was Watch Dogs. They said, we're, we're, we're being... I've just kind of given it away. It was a Ubisoft person. It doesn't matter anymore. Um, we're, we're announcing something amazing tomorrow. It's going to blow your head off. Like, you're going to be so surprised. You're not even going to see it coming. But, you know, like, hit me up on the show floor and I'll make sure you can see it. And I don't know if they remembered they told me that, but I definitely pulled that card and, you know, took advantage of that offer after the Ubisoft press conference and finding out it was Watch Dogs. And it was there. I happened to be in the line waiting to see it. And so was Will Wheaton, now from wow. Star Trek, Picard, and a whole bunch of other things. But that was cool. That was, like, one of my little, like, I met a famous person at, at E3 Stories and got to see Watch Dogs before some of us were horribly disappointed by what Watch Dogs turned out to be. That was, yeah, I would say Watch Dogs is probably close to, if not the most hyped game of the show, of any show. Like, the, the the insane level of hype for that was, like, next level. The only thing I would say was close to it, not at, not on the showroom floor, at a press conference, I think the biggest reveal I was in the room for, and as we say, very different when you're there compared to watching at home, was uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake being announced. I think in 2015... And I'm not a Final Fantasy guy, so I like it seemed like everyone but me in the room knew me immediately what this is. I was just like, what that? Um, but it was just like such an energy that I don't think has been like I don't think I've ever felt that again. Like it was ne- like there's a lot of hype for a lot of games at E3, but that one was next level, uh, and I did play it because of that, and I quite enjoyed it. So yeah, that was that was pretty up there. Um, yeah, I didn't have any like super weird celebrity cameos, mainly because like i don't want to be that guy but i got so many street passes of them. 
I got like my celeb street pass collection because that was I spent so much time street passing. Who who were some of your celeb street passes? You had Miyamoto. That's that was a given. Uh, I got Miyamoto a bunch of times. Uh, a lot of them were yeah, were kind of like I got. I see no, my celeb encounter Snoop Dogg. I got a photo with Snoop because that was the first year I went, and I was in like the EA media. They used to have a media section in their booth, and I was there playing FIFA. And this like gigantic, like, I don't know, seven foot security guard, just like, hey, bro, Snoop's going to come play. You got to get out. I was like, what? <laughs> and because it was like my first time in LA, I'm like, barely understand him. And just like this massive guy. And then I, he's just like, oh, yeah, sorry, man. You want a photo? Uh, so I got a photo with Snoop. Nice. And then uh, he stunk like weed. And I'm surprised. I like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think I did. Uh, did I get it? Did he have street pass? Can't remember. Maybe that wasn't a thing at that point. That was 2012. So yeah, that was my, <laughs> I'm, that's I'm, my I'm only leaving this booth and you can play FIFA on my, uh, my station if you street pass with me, Snoop. What are you talking yeah. about? Um, and then next year, not a celebrity, but we couldn't get a taxi. Uh, and so one of the PR reps and I got a limo thing. Not a limo. It was like a pri- What's like one down from limo? Fancy it's like a private car. Thing. An Uber private before car. there was Uber. But he was also a limo driver. Uh, he gave me his card. It was like limo driver slash actor slash model slash like the most LA thing I've ever come across. I think still got his card somewhere. That's like uh, everybody so in LA like, though. Oh yeah, no, yeah. this is my day job. I'm a, I'm a writer for TV. What have you written? Oh, nothing yet, but I'm going to be big one day. Like, oh, okay. I, I, yeah. I hope it works out for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was playing Halo. It was Halo, it must have been Halo 4. And people yeah, were behind me. People were behind me saying, "Oh, you're doing pretty good," or like, "Shoot that guy." And I like turned back to to say something back to them, and I realized it was Nathan Fillion and Alan Tudyk from Firefly. And I just my jaw dropped. I handed them the controller. Like I don't. I just decided that they wanted to play instead of me, and I just let them. So I didn't even have security guards asking me to leave. I just left and let them. I got a photo. It's like the drunkenest, blurriest photo. I think Nathan Fillion took it. Mm. which was great and then if i'm on celebrity sightings i was it was like the last day of e3 it was kind of empty by then because it was must have been late in the day and i was finishing up something and the walkways like all the aisles were pretty empty so that meant i could very clearly plainly see that the varburton was walking towards me and i like willed up enough courage to like say oh i'm such a fan can i get a quick photo and like he had someone who was with him take the photo that's great like I've met so many Star Trek people from E3, and I'm never going to have the opportunity to do it again. It makes me so sad. Yeah. I'd say I think my, my most enjoyable celebrity moment is the guy everyone's met at any convention ever, which is Charles Martinet. Yeah. Um, but so, I mean, I've met him a few times, but we were, uh, Steve Farrelly from Oz Gamers and I were sitting at our hotel bar, like at the actual bar, as you do only in America, and this like, slightly older gentleman right next to us like takes off his hat or whatever and it's Charles Martin and he's staying there and he's like just chatting with us and I think we had a bottle of red wine with him or something it's just like just was that chatting. the Sheraton I can't remember the bar or the hotel I, I think remember. it was the hotel because that, that's I exactly remember. where I met him and fairly said oh I don't know he's he's here every year and he's just he's always at the bar if he's not doing something he's, he's at the bar and I would yeah. just I would take my laptop down and go and like write up stories there and have a drink and Charles was there and by the end of like the week I was just like oh hey Charles what's going on like, yeah not much what's happening He's the nicest guy. The nicest guy. Uh, In terms of actually, well, we can talk Friendly Fire Show at E3 because we we recorded this show several times there. My one of them was a bit dodgy, like in the corner of the the convention center on a like a snowball mic. mic, The upstairs um, bit. The upstairs bit. That episode didn't work out so well. I think the ones we did in when we all stayed together. So normally we obviously had hotel rooms or whatever. But one year, 2015, when we had like our Airbnb pretty close. Uh, that was actually pretty fun. Like going back at the end of the day and recording an episode about what we'd all seen. Did we go through a case of beer in an hour though? I think we did. Two nights. Well, there were two ways. It was Bud Light. So, you know, it's a healthy choice. (laughs) Oh yeah. The most American choice. Yeah. They probably don't listen back that well, but it was like, that's, that's the fun moments of everyone saw different stuff. It's like five guys who all had different schedules and we'd get back and just basically chat about what we saw and we, we just happened to record it. Uh, we did it as well. That no, I think the 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 year we had the case of beer was in the Lux. Like that was that's probably a worse episode. Oh yeah. Um, well, they were good for us. So yeah, they were it's... good for us. I think we might have done a better job 2015 when we were we realized that and we just we we, you know, we chatted first and then we had like yeah we still had the Bud Lights but we everyone's just sitting around writing up stuff and we earlier years we were probably a bit more on oh we need to go to this X party because we've been invited and they'll 
you know, we need to make an appearance or whatever to, I think we moved away from that little, we still went to some, uh, but it was a bit more, actually, it's more enjoyable to, to record an episode of this show, to sit around, have a couple of beers and, and write up some of this stuff. Yeah. And that was as a group, like there's something about having a few people around you doing the same thing and you, as opposed to just you on your own in your hotel room. Yeah. Which is something you, it's, you wouldn't really do that now, but it was definitely the, the peak of the Friendly Fire show at E3. And it's weird, like thinking of my my take on E3 and what it meant to me and what it means to me now. It's all well, I guess meant past tense. It's probably dead, but like I, I wouldn't have missed a press conference for the world, and it made everything really hard because then you had to figure out how to write about what you saw because like there's no way you were gonna do it sitting in the press conference. To then like in the last couple of years, I went. Even though I'm in LA, I'm going to sit here with like two screens. I'm going to use the hotel internet so I know I have a stable connection. I'm just going to write up the press conference from my hotel room as it's happening because it's way easier. Like someone else can go or we'll like, you know, we know it's going to be, you know, the focal point of Microsoft's presence on the floor. So then I know I want to go and try to see A, B and C or whatever. And like to the point where on the years, because you and I eventually were swapping basically the years that I was just doing it from home usually happened to have something like the Resident Evil 7 demo was out now and I just, you know was at home yeah. I wasn't like in a hotel room without an Xbox or something I could just like literally go and download the demo start recording it put that on YouTube and it was like advantageous so you do miss out on the interaction and the connection and the ability to get access to things but like some aspects of the job were easier the way that E3 has sort of changed over the years so or the way that you wanted to tackle it so each to their own yeah, definitely challenges as trying to actually work at E3, I think. And that's that's one of the big changes. It was less people there to work, more people there as fans and to have fun. And the people who were getting in with public tickets and the people who were probably a bunch of retailers started just giving away their tickets to people. I suspect that started happening probably 2013, 14, when it was like, we don't really need to have 50 people from GameStop going. Like, we can have two and like just give them away to your kids or something. Like, there seemed to be more of that. Yeah, uh, and it did make it harder. All those people just in your way to actually get stuff done. So, yeah, that's that's all probably part of why it had its demise. It became less of a trade show and more of a public spectacle, which you can do from home. Like I, I think they will realize you don't need that. But we had a lot of good times there. Yeah, um, and I'm sure everyone everyone who went did, and lots of memories this week. Well, and we've said I've said this before, but if I hadn't have gone in 2012 and you hadn't have gone in 2012 i think my life would be very different i don't think i would have gotten to know you as well as i did that year i don't think i would have been friends with you to the extent that i've been friends with you i don't think all the stuff like this podcast potentially wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't have, have happened 236 episodes of the show that's true it was weird that we we met in la even though we both lived in melbourne at the time it yeah. wasn't a huge certainly the few years after that the the melbourne kind of games scene uh, got a bit bigger like but at that time it didn't really seem like it It was like the odd event but it was mainly you need to go to sydney if you want to do anything yep uh, less stuff coming to melbourne so a lot of the melbourne peeps didn't really know each other at least not to the degree that they do now or they did maybe maybe pre-covid i'm sure a bunch don't know each other now because there wasn't events for three years uh, well yeah, and, and having an hour at you know at fortress melbourne is maybe enough time to do some like s small talk, but not like we got to know each other pretty well by the end of that trip alone, let alone like. Yeah, I think there, I feel like there were heaps of relatively new people that year, as in from the Australian group. And because we were all coordinating our schedules with the same kind of PR people, we often got to the same, invited to the same after hours events. And it was very, certainly the first few years, it was very much a you need to network with people and you, you may as well meet people while you're here. Yeah. And it was often you'd run into, I mean, we ran into each other. If we hadn't gone to like the same three events in a row, we probably wouldn't have like, like the first couple of times we met each other is probably your standard small talk, like, oh yeah, chat to be nice. And then by the third time, it's like you again. Well, and that's how you, I mean, that's how you meet people. And I had an accent. So like you were saying, your first time in LA, it probably took you two or three times to even understand that's what true. I was saying. So I was like, how has this weirdo gotten onto the Australian drinks? Like one of the Canadians is here. Why, why aren't you saying castle like a new, new Nova Castrian? Is that what? It, no, that's New South Wales. Like a South Australian. You have a weird accent too, is what I was trying to get at. That's true. I've destroyed yeah. any nice emotional, sentimental thing yeah, that I was that, kicking that, up. That's a good point. Wayne. So that's, <laughs> we're back to we're back to normal programming. We may or may not be back next week, and then I won't at least be here for a couple of weeks. You might be here with some special guests. Who mm. knows? It's going to be a mystery for all of us, or maybe it'll just be me back in a few weeks. 
We'll yeah, we'll, we'll see how we go. I think I think you've worked extra long enough. I think you you deserve just a nice long break and uh, and a, a trip to Japan. And then yeah, I don't know. I, I I feel like you've conveniently timed your arrival back into Australia to be adjacent to the launch of a uh, Zelda Tears of the Absolutely. Kingdom for a very specific reason. So not that we're going to talk about that when you arrive uh, back to the country, but I'm sure we'll talk about that in the next couple we'll weeks or that. something. So that's right. Well, I'll see you soon.